Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 15 of AJTV. I am AJ Soccer, and I spent way too much time on this episode. I wanted to talk about the blue-red tutelage deck that recently broke onto the scene in Standard, both in terms of specifics of how the deck works and how to beat it, but also generalities about velocity. Andrew Cuneo built a deck around Sphinx's tutelage for PT Origins in Vancouver that Michael Majors used a week later to crush GP San Diego. Seriously, he didn't just win the tournament, he completely dominated it. On its surface, it appears to be a sort of control deck with weird card drawers, when in reality it's probably the most aggressive deck Cuneo's ever designed, not that that's saying too much from the guy who basically invented control. Certainly a weird looking deck, virtually creatureless with only the four Jaces, and no way to deal even a single point of damage to an opponent in the entire 75. If you watch my stream a lot, you'll probably hear me talk about Velocity quite a bit. Uh, sometimes call them touches or looks. Simply put, Velocity is the rate at which you see additional cards, especially in the early game. Things like cantrips and card selection. My go-to example for years has been Compulsive Research versus Tidings. Compulsive Research was a huge staple, four of in many different decks. Tidings was a fringe playable with, you know, one or two copies showing up from time to time. Now why would that be the case when Tidings is clearly, from a purely economical standpoint, far superior to compulsive research? Obviously there are a multitude of environmental reasons that haven't been relevant for about 8 years, so we'll skip those, but mostly it's about velocity. Plus 1 card now, or even plus 0 cards now, is better than plus 3 cards later. The cheaper cost and ability to see a bunch of cards, even if you don't get to keep them all, is what pushes compulsive ahead of something like Tidings. The velocity allows you to smooth out your draws in terms of finding your mana and having options for sequencing. As well as something called the snowball effect, which I've written an article about and will probably discuss in future videos. For more recent examples we can look to modern. Modern decks play numerous cantrips and are still always trying to find ways to jam more into their deck. In magic, oftentimes cards in graveyard is actually a resource of its own. In modern you're rewarded for having a good graveyard with things like Snapcaster Mage, Eternal Witness, and Delve Cards, Gurmog Angler, and the Banana King. Standard is no different. Den Protector, the backside of Jace, and even more powerful Delve Cards, Treasure Cruise, and Dig Through Time, all incentivize you to fill your graveyard as much as possible. In Standard, we have Temples. It seems that Temples are constantly in a state of being underrated somehow. They're basically free opts. Instead of drawing a card, you get a land into play, but it costs one mana by coming up into play tapped versus actually casting it, and you look at the top card and you can put it on the bottom or the top. Obviously there are slight differences where the opt has different synergies for being an instant, and you get the card instantaneously so that you could use it right away if it's good, whereas the temple fixes your mana and doesn't cost you deck slots, which is an underrated resource by being a land that you would play anyway. Temples are the source of nearly all the velocity we see in Standard today, mostly due to a lack of good cantrips. All we have access to right now is Anticipate. Another way to increase consistency is Redundancy, having multiple copies of cards that have similar effects. This deck can basically be broken down into three simple categories, Draw, Stall, and Mana and tutelages, with some cards even overlapping, such as Jace being able to block and then activate and flip is both draw and stall. The eight gain lands are obviously mana and stall, while the scry lands act as draw and stall. Having such a high velocity deck has a lot of distinct advantages. Sometimes in Magic there are non-games that happen. You keep a two-lander on the draw and never hit another land drop. Well, that very rarely happens with this deck. A huge land count and high velocity makes it so that it's pretty impossible to be mana screwed early, and all of the card draw and cycling makes it pretty hard to be flooded late. When you see huge percentages of your deck, and huge percentages of your deck are redundant, you're going to end up with a really consistent deck that can more easily navigate themselves into profitable game types. In the nine games he played on camera, which is admittedly a fairly small sample size, Michael Majors didn't mulligan a single time. Not only is this deck less susceptible to mulligans than most, it also recovers better on the rare occasion that it does have to go to Paris. I somewhat arbitrarily chose turn 5 as the tipping point of early game becoming mid game for standard, and examined the game states. This should kind of come as a given as he demolished the tournament, but what I saw was extremely impressive. 
For starters, 45 out of 45 of those land drops were made. Not a single one missed in all 9 games. Seeing the velocity in action, Michael got to see over 5 extra cards over the course of those first 5 turns. Contrast that with his opponent's average of just over 1. Not only that, but it's not like he was investing all of his mana possible into his velocity. It's just about every one of those game states was dominant, with Michael ending up with over one copy of either Tutelage, a Siege on Cons, or a Flip Jace already in play by turn 5. In addition to being a head 4 card scene. The deck is essentially a 1 card combo deck. The other combo piece being Card Jars and Time Buyers, both of which you're playing anyway. It's a game of Protect the Queen, but with a twist. The Queen's an enchantment. Just look at how few ways to interact with it the other top 8 decks even had. Ben White's Jess Guy deck actually has no ways to interact in the main deck. Post board he gets access to 3 Revoke Existence, 2 Negate, and Disdainful Strokes if he wants them. The other side of that coin being that he has Wild Slashes, Lightning Strikes, Stoke the Flames, the Jess Guy Charm, all pretty much dead cards. Dan Ward's Breakout Black Red Dragons deck had access to 3 Thoughtseize's main, Hero's Downfalls for Jaces, and a creature base that actually performs pretty well against Michael Major's deck, but we'll get to that in a minute. Post-board he gets access to another Thoughtseize, the 5th and 6th discard spells in the form of 2 Duress, and then Read the Bones and Hero's Downfall, Chandra if he wants it, if only because he has so many dead cards in his main deck. Paul Rietzel's Abzan Control deck has 4 Thoughtseize's main, but you'll see a significant lack of Jermica's commands. His clock is not too impressive either. The sideboard gives him two more discard spells, two Dromica's Command as well as one Unravel the Aether, two Read the Bones to help find them, and if he does hit one of his three ways to kill an enchantment post board, his two Den Protectors actually do a little work. With access to three Dromica's Command's main as well as four Den Protectors to get them back, the fourth Dromica's Command out of the board as well as two Unravel the Aether, Lauren's deck has to be one of the better suited for this matchup in the top eight. Paul Yim's Esper Dragons list only has three Thought Seizes, as well as two Dissolves and the full set of Selmgar Scorns. That may seem like a lot until you realize that once a tutelage sticks, it's likely game over. His Gabriel Nassif-esque sideboard has access to the fourth Thought Seize, as well as the pretty brutal Orbs of Warding. And that's pretty much it. Disdainful Strokes if he wants them, Jace is probably good, Perilous Vault is not the most effective answer to three mana enchantments I've ever seen. Much like the Ugin main deck, theoretically it can take out a tutelage, but the game is probably over by then. Not to mention the vulnerability to the sideboard negates. Michael's finals opponent was playing Abzan Constellation, and holy smokes was it a blowout. Seriously, go watch that match. It'll take you about six minutes. Not the most surprising result when you look at the lists. Only the two Thought Seizes accompanying the four Banishing Lights main deck. Brain Maggots are not the most effective way to attack the Tutelage deck. His sideboard only gives him two more copies of Thought Seize. In fact, he was so desperate for ways to interact that he ported in his two infinite obliterations that can only hit the Jaces out of Michael Major's deck. Ah yes, Corey Burkhart's Abzan Aggro list. Corey was actually the only player to take an actual match off of Michael Majors in the entire tournament. That's the game we're going to look at in a minute. Straight off the bat, you can see how aggressively stanced this creature base is, as well as being fairly resilient to things like Anger the Gods. Packing all four copies of Dromica's Command main, with only the three ultimate prices sticking out as particularly dead in the matchup. Post-board, he gets access to four more discard spells, as well as to Unravel the Aether. Remember that in addition to these players not having a ton of cards in their 75 that can interact with the tutelage, Michael Majors also gets the sideboard. With the four full copies of Negate, and seeing as much of his deck as he does every game, that's going to feel a lot more like five or maybe six Negates, as well as five or maybe six tutelages. When you look at the numbers that way, it becomes clear how difficult it is to interact with its Sphinx's tutelage when you don't really have a very high count of cards that actually do something. So how do you beat a one-card combo deck like this? The natural answer is obviously disruption, while a more aggressive player may say pressure. The truth is that you need a combination of the two if you want to hope to win. And not only do you need both pressure and disruption, you need specific kinds of both. It's not as simple as playing a single threat and riding it to victory versus a deck with roasts. But it's also pretty hard to go low to the ground and wide against a deck with anger of the gods. Even if you put together a couple of unangerable threats, you can still be raced with the help of Send Asleep and Whelming Wave. Wait a minute, 
octopuses? Not not, not octop octopuses. My life is a lie. It might seem like they have all the angles covered, but there are threats that you can make that are effective against this strategy. Four toughness is the first benchmark, getting over anger of the gods and fiery impulse post board. The second benchmark is flying. You can substitute flying with six toughness, but that's a lot harder to get. And lastly, your creature is obviously going to have to get around Whelming Wave, so it'll be an octopus. If you don't have any cephalopod on hand, haste will work just as well. Take another look at Dan Ward's Black Red Dragons list. Hangerback Walker and Goblin Rapple Master aren't the best against Anger of the Gods, but they serve pretty well against Roast. After that, Thunderbreak Regent, Stormbreath Dragons, and the one Colgon are all excellent against the removal suite of the Tutelage deck, even without playing any octopuses. Pretty much all of Michael Majors' feature matches involved him beating the ever-living crap out of his opponent. Corey Burkhart was the only player to take a match off of him in the entire tournament. Let's see how he did it. Majors has the play in game 1, Corey Mulligan to 6. Turn 2, Jace, and Corey has a Fleece Main Lion. Michael loots. This card's an insight, and kills the lion with a roast. Corey doesn't let up though. Scries to the bottom, and plays a Warden of the First Tree. Michael loots again, discards a Send Asleep, and plays his second Roast on the Warden. That's a really mana-profitable exchange for Cory. He follows it up with a Rhino now that both Roasts are gone. But with Jace in play ready to flip, all that does is price him into using it. Rhino down. Insight gets cast, and the turn is passed back to Cory, who has another Rhino. The Roasts are now overextended, and another Scry to the bottom for Cory as well. Tormenting Voice discarding a Magmatic Insight, which is a pretty good sign that Michael is on the back foot. Plays the front side of a Jace, pluses his back side of the Jace on the Rhino, and passes the turn. Rhino attacks Jace. No blocks, and it's blowout time. The main deck Jerome's command basically kills two Jaces straight up. This 5-6 Rhino is looking pretty strong. He also looted away a Whelming Wave, so it's definitely looking a little difficult for him to deal with the board. So he goes into race mode, Sphinx's tutelage into Treasure Cruise, now that the Jerome's command is out of Cory's hand. The Abzan deck does have a lot of multicolored cards in it, which means that the tutelage gets to double up quite a bit. Tormenting Voice discarding a land means that Michael got five triggers off of his tutelage that turn. But Corey doesn't let the pressure up. He knows that it's clearly a race at this point and puts a Herald on the Siege Rhino. Not quite a two-turn clock, but it's a lot of damage that's actually somewhat resilient to Whelming Wave as well. Majors, desperate for gas, has to use the tutelage loot, which is an indication that perhaps he could have saved one of the magmatic insights that he discarded from earlier, but likely indicates that he has a handful of land. Another activation of tutelage shows that he is indeed on empty, and he scoops shortly thereafter. With game 1 won by substantial pressure followed by Jamroka's command and a little poor luck on the side of Michael Majors, he's on the play and leads with a Cliffs, and gets the rest by Cory. A hand of Jace, Send to Sleep, Tormenting Voice, and three lands. The Tormenting Voice being the only Velocity card is the clear take, and out comes Jace. Cory wastes no time putting a clock on Michael, and plays a turn 2 Fleece Main Lion. With little of relevance in hand, and already under the gun, he feels the need to play tutelage to get some pressure as this is clearly going to race mode. But Dramoka's command is a massive blowout, fighting the Jace with the lion and taking out the tutelage. His third land is also a scry land, which puts a card on the bottom. Michael Major is very much at the mercy of the top of his deck, does find a second copy of the tutelage, but is still in desperate need of some of the velocity cards to start snowballing and chain together. Thoughtseize hits his Send to Sleep, and Cory has it unravel the Aether. And after using all three of his mana, plays another Scry Land, and bottoms another card. Michael, under significant pressure and with only a land in hand, draws a Temple for the turn and keeps his card on top. Cory plays a Warden and passes the turn back. 
The card Michael kept was a Jace. Corey activates his Warden and drops his first mana of the entire game. Monstrous the Fleece main to play around Anger and get in an extra point. Also gets around Send Asleep by a bit. Michael finds a third copy of the Tutelage and leaves back Jace to fog a creature. When Jace is going to flip on the activation, what you can do is pass the turn, block with it, and then activate it before damage. You sacrifice a use of the Planeswalker for fogging a creature for a turn. Herald goes on the Fleece main, which not only represents a two-turn clock, but also means that once this Lion hit gets through, even a Whelming Wave leaves the lethal Herald on board. Jace blocks the Warden and flips. Michael falls to two with only one card in hand. The incidental triggers of the tutelage not likely to add up to anything of relevance. He would have to literally race from here. Tormenting Voice discarding a uh, negate, which is a bit embarrassing when this far behind on board. Tutelage does hit some doubles, but that doesn't matter much unless Michael can find cards that don't exist. Treasure Cruise, hoping to get some lucky tutelage triggers off and maybe formulate some insane lethal from downtown, but doesn't get there, and Michael Majors loses the only match that he would lose all weekend. And there you have it. Episode 15 in the books. Hope you enjoyed it. Maybe you learned something. This episode of AJTV was brought to you by Blue Spider, Sergey S, Peter Go Lightly, Liquid Snake, Andy Talaga, which I just found out means really in Tagalog. Candlehawk. Arkanoi. JKing1982. Which I like to read as JKing1982. Like you're joking a whole year. But all I know about 1982 is that it's when Blade Runner came out. And that movie is no joke. Surfcat. And Darren S. As well as everybody else over on the show's Patreon. Thanks everybody so much for watching. If you want to support the show, go over and check out the Patreon. There's a video that explains what it is and how you can help. It's only a minute long, so give it a look. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss any videos. I also live stream Magic Online at twitch.tv slash AJSoccer. I stream Mondays and Thursdays and whenever else I feel like. In case you missed it, here's a link to the last episode of AJTV. And here's a link to a podcast I did with R&D member Gavin Verhey. So go check out some or all of those. And I'll see you next time.